Good morning, everybody. I am Mariana Campero, and it is truly a pleasure to be here today. We have an incredible lineup and a great turnout, so thank you very much. I will waste no time and welcome our first two speakers of the day. Martinez Covari, co-president co and as of today or very recently, also the head of global growth equity at GA, and Luis Cervantes, managing director and head of GA's Mexico's office. As some of you know, General Atlantic is one of the most successful private equity investors in growth companies, and one of the first to recognize inno innovation occurring in Latin America. So, Martin, Luis, welcome. Thank you very much, Mariana, for having us, and thank you very much, everyone, for joining us this morning for what we hope will be a fascinating discussion around the intersection of economic, politics, entrepreneurship, and investing in Latin America. Latin America faces well-known structural issues, including economic volatility, poverty, political instability, currency depreciations, and a lack of infrastructure regarding health and education. These issues have hampered economic mobility and productivity gains in the region and in turn have affected development across all of our countries and have also impacted the United States across many issues, including immigration. From our perch as a global investor, we have seen time and time again the impact that entrepreneurship can have in solving many of the most pressing problems in our world. And Latin America is no exception. The tough macroeconomic environment in Latin America has resulted in big problems, including the ones mentioned before. But today, we're seeing a great generation of entrepreneurs that are leveraging technology to go and solve these problems that include financial inclusion, fraud management, and access to all of these very important services. In 2021 and 22, Latin America so record years in terms of venture capital and growth equity investment. Investments in the region skyrocketed to $23 billion in those two years. 16 new unicorns, including Clip and Kavak, were minted. And many tech companies went public in global exchanges, including Nubank, The Local, and XP. We believe Latin America today is at an inflection point regarding the digitalization of the economy. Over the last 10 years, the infrastructure needed for digital companies to thrive has been built. Data costs have decreased by 40%, and internet penetration has increased to 71% over these few years. This has allowed digital companies to be built, and consumers have been fast adopters of these new services. This has been achieved thanks to many collaborators in the industry that were pioneers, including Carlos, David, and Adolfo, that raised VC funding at a time where funding was really scarce in Latin America. Non-for-profit organizations also played a big role, including Endeavor, who has been on the ground for 25 years in Mexico and in Latin America, and has supported over 400 companies across the region. We at GA have also been very active in Latin America for the last 23 years, having invested more than $5 billion and having taken more than five companies public in the global exchanges. Today, Latin America represents almost 10% of our global portfolio, and Latin America has been one of the best performing regions for us on a global basis over the last five and 10 years. However, tech companies are experiencing a tougher macro environment today given rising interest rates, increasing inflation, and elevated geopolitical risks. This is affecting funding to tech companies on a global basis, and Latin America is no exception, with year-to-date funding into the region decreasing by 40% compared to last year. Even against these macro headwinds, we believe now is the time to continue to invest and build in Latin America. But how do we give entrepreneurs the tools and the space needed to succeed. 
we think there are three main challenges that we need to help as a group to overcome. First is the attraction of talent. Many Latin American companies are executing global expansion plans, including Kavak, Incode, Hotmart, Gympas. If you look at the talent bench of many of these companies, they are at par to the best companies around the world. We need to double down on the attraction of great talent into the Latin American region. The great opportunity and remote work are tailwinds that will help us do that, but we also need to continue improving our immigration and visa uh, services in order to attract this talent that is needed for Latin American companies to execute on a global stage. Secondly, we need to continue attracting foreign capital. In 2021, 60% of the capital that flew into the region came from foreign investors. We need to provide tax certainty to these investors and avoid retroactive moves that change the way in which foreign investment is treated in Latin America. And we also need to continue to foster the IPO market in the region in order to prove that the cycle can be completed and that there can be amazing success stories in the region. To do that, we, continue, we need to continue to develop the retail investment market and also foster participation of our regional pension funds in tech IPOs in the region. And finally, regulatory support. Regula we need to continue to enforce competition laws that have allowed new players to go into very concentrated industries such as financial services and really become a disruptors. Competition is good for Latin America and it drives meritocracy and diversity in the business community. So how do we achieve this? While we do not believe there is a silver bullet, we believe the answer lies in public-private collaboration and we at GA are ready to do our part. As we look ahead into the region, we couldn't be more excited about what's coming next for the next few years. We continue to be very bullish on the region and believe that the next generation of great entrepreneurs is being built right now. We feel honored to be able to support the Latin American ecosystem and to be a small part of the stories that you will hear today about the impact of great entrepreneurs in the region. A stronger entrepreneurial environment will result in a stronger Latin America and a stronger Latin America is great for the US. I'll pass it to Martin before heading it over to, to, to Chob as well. Thank you, Luis. Mariana, thank you for organizing an event on my favorite topic in the world, entrepreneurship in Latin America. Entrepreneurship in Latin America has defined my life since I was a kid. I, uh, I started as an entrepreneur in my 20s in Brazil and was part of a team that built Submarino.com, which was an e-commerce company. and was the first company, first technology company to go public in the Bovespa and became uh, one of the first of many companies that went on in 20 years ago to find the first wave of innovation and entrepreneurship and technology disruption in, in LATAM. After exiting that company, I began to volunteer with Endeavor. I've been a supporter of Endeavor in Latin America for 20 plus years. I'm now on the board of Endeavor, which supports entrepreneurship globally, but in the region, and have met hundreds and hundreds of young men and women who've left their cushy corporate jobs and dared to take a risk and start a company. As an investor, and I've been an investor now for 20 years, um, I've had the honor and the privilege to invest in a company that would go on to become the first technology com Brazilian technology company to go public in the NASDAQ, an education company called Arco. I also had the privilege of investing in the largest IPO in the New York Exchange of a Brazilian company called XP, and also supported the first unicorns out of Mexico, our friend Clip, and also out of Uruguay, our friends from uh, the local. So I've seen up, up close uh, entrepreneurship and the tech ecosystem evolved in Latin America over the last 20 years from non-existing to a thriving successful uh, e e e e e e ecosystem and it's been a profitable journey for many many of our of our, of our entrepreneurs and uh, of our of the funds. Uh, Luis was modest uh, Latin America for the last 10 years has been the most profitable region for General Atlantic in in the globe 
and it is the toughest region in which to become an entrepreneur. But our, our experience is, is, is an example that it is possible to invest successfully back in great minds in, in, in the emerging markets and particularly in, in Latin America. Today you will hear about three great stories of entrepreneurship. I think they share three common traits that are common to most of the successful stories coming out of, of the region. Uh, first, a sense of purpose. Uh, the, three, the, the, the three entrepreneurs you will hear about today care deeply about meeting the unmet customer de needs of the rising middle class or of the small businesses in, in Latin America. And they changed their lives for the better, and in doing that became very profitable and built multi-billion dollar companies. They also share grit. It's hard. It's very hard. And you have to overcome odds that are massively against you. And they are also incredibly ambitious. The sky is the limit. These three characteristics are characteristics that I think are shared by all successful entrepreneurs in our region. The challenges, I think Luis uh, highlighted them uh, well. If I had a magic lamp and the, and, and the genie came up to me and said, what are your three wishes for uh, tech entrepreneurship in Latin America? I'd, I'd ask for the following three things. For the young entrepreneurs, more ambition. Latin American entrepreneurs are as good as, in, as Silicon Valley or Shanghai or London, but they lack self-confidence. We've been beaten up for far too long. We need to believe in ourselves a little bit more. And role models like the three gentlemen you'll hear about are great at instilling self-confidence in them. So that's first. For investors, I wish their interest and passion for Latin America was a permanent love, not an occasional summer fling. They become interested in our region once every 10 years and they forget us for a decade. Don't forget us for a decade. We're still just as attractive as we were when we were initially in love. Commit to the region long term. It, will, it is better for all parties. Uh, and for regulators uh, and government officials, um, embrace growth and innovation. Growth and innovation and change drive prosperity, uh, drive change drive progress. Entrepreneurship is the engine of growth and innovation. And as it regards to, uh, to the relationship between the US and Latin America, it's very simple. Uh, shared prosperity benefits both sides of the Rio Grande. Let's invest in our shared prosperity permanently and for the long term. So I'm delighted to be here and I look forward to hearing from our great entrepreneurs. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin, Luis. That was really interesting. And now it is my pleasure to welcome Juan Luis Ortega, president of Chubb International General Operations. Chubb is the largest publicly traded property and casualty insurer in the world. And it's also an example of how a large financial services company has identified this opportunity and is partnering with many technology entrepreneurs, not only to improve job, but also to create better and more affordable products for the new digitally connected customers. Juan Luis, please welcome. Thank you, Mariana, and, uh, and thank you for everyone in attendance today. Um, I am so glad we're sponsoring this event uh, in partnership with General Atlantic. But Martin, I must say, I, I take exception at something you said. Not all corporate jobs are cushy. Um, <laughs> certainly not at job. Um, but, um, and, and these guys can, that work with us in partnership, they, they know it's not a cushy, cushy life. It's, it's highly entrepreneurial as well. Anyway, but um, at job, we believe um, it is important to shine a bright light uh, on these Latin American stories, since they represent in such a clear way the creativity, resourcefulness, and resiliency of so many others across the region. The economic story that is developing, thanks to digital entrepreneurs like Adolfo, Carlos, and David, is unusual in a region accustomed to commodity-driven cycles that have historically fallen short of providing those long-term benefits for the greater population. Today, we'll hear about the stories where millions of consumers gain access to financial and other online services, and these stories mobilize traditional companies to invest and modernize as well. 
This in turn drives labor markets to become more vibrant with the demand created for a bilingual and STEM educated youth. At CHOP, we've been operating Latin America for more than 70 years and have uh, seen the region's progress and volatility up close. In the last decade, we have built more than 200 partnerships around the world with innovators and disruptors like these gentlemen here um, and have invested heavily in our own digital transformation. It is a requirement nowadays. From this vantage point, we can clearly see the positive impact these digital companies are having in the region. And, and three main themes come to mind. First, there's the accessibility factor. Um, whether it's their first car purchase, their first credit card being opened in a seamless and safe way. Um, customers in Latin America are not only accessing a specific one-time service or product through these companies, but they're also entering the formal economy and the opportunity that that brings. With that entry ticket, the broader world of financial planning opens up for them. Nubank, Kavak, and Clip are providing this greater access. Secondly, if you're a company that wants to be part of this digital e ecosystem, if you want to trade and do business with these guys, or even if you want to compete against them, you need to be in digital shape. Um, that means API connectivity, response times measured in milliseconds, having teams that can work in agile, way, in an ag in agile ways with strong an an data analytics capability. Getting companies into digital shape requires greater investment in technology and people. Um, and that brings me to the third area of positive impact of this e ecosystem. With all that aggregated demand for talented individuals in Latin America, in the fields of software engineering, data science, digital infrastructure, and security management, companies across Latin America and abroad need to find ways to invest their resources, um, to invest these resources in a scalable way. In this context, pro, uh, pooling resources into centralized locations just makes economic sense. At Chubb, we have invested in a tech and service center out of Monterrey, Mexico where universities for long have um, seen these trends and are investing more in STEM curriculums and English skills. These capabilities help build long-term competitive advantages for the region, different to commodity-driven cycles, away from political instability. These, are long, uh, these will serve the long-term needs of the region. So this is a truly virtuous and sustainable cycle for Latin America, driven by the private sector and utilizing the talents of an aspiring and well-educated population. This is the story of the people in Latin America that work, create wealth, and create innovation. So for all these reasons, and in, uh, in, in hopes of being brief, um, and on behalf of all of us at, at Chubb, thank you, Carlos, David, and Adolfo for joining us today, and thank you, Mariana, and CSIS for bringing us all together to listen to these great stories. Thank you. Thank you very much, Juan Luis. Um, the stories most of us hear and tell about Latin America are usually stories of violence, corruption, drugs, or migration. Yet, as we just heard from GA and Chubb, there is a whole other story occurring in the region that has not yet caught the attention nor the headlines of many here in Washington. And it is the story of the digital economy and Latin America's entrepreneurs. Yet, as we just heard, it has certainly caught the attention of major international companies and investors. In fact, according to Bloomberg, $46 billion was raised in Latin American companies between 2018 and 2022. In 2021 alone, there were 45 unicorns, but hundreds of other startups throughout the region are driving innovation, transforming the economies, and empowering small businesses. Literally, they're banking the unbanked, insuring the uninsured, and offering high-quality services to millions that had previously been ignored. And today, we have the privilege to hear from three of the most successful entrepreneurs in the region. Adolfo Babats, CEO of Clips, Carlos Garciotati, CEO of Cavac, 
and David Vélez, CEO of Nubank. Please join me in giving them a very warm welcome. Thank you very, very much for being here with us. It is truly a pleasure for me and for CSIS to have such an incredible panel. Uh, let me start with you, David. A friend of mine from Stanford University told me that the school's auditorium was packed with people that wanted to hear your story. You certainly became a celebrity, and by building New bank into the largest digital bank, not only in Latin America, but in the world. Can you please tell us your story? Sure, I'm happy to, and, and thank you to you, Mariana, and thank you, to, thank you to CSIS for having us here, telling a great story about Latin America. <clears throat> so I, uh, I moved to Brazil, I'm originally from Colombia, I moved to Brazil in 2013 uh, to open the local office of one of the Silicon Valley funds. And I think as anybody has been in Brazil and has moved to a new country, one of the first things that you have to do is open a bank account. So one afternoon, I, I go to open a bank account in one of the big branches in Faria Lima. Faria Lima is the equivalent of Fifth Avenue, the center of financial services in Latin America. And it was one of the worst experiences I think anybody could <laughs> hope for. I had to go to this bulletproof door uh, where alarms started sounding because I had a cell phone. I was escorted out of the branch, was asked to put all my bags in a locker outside, had to go walk back in, wait about 15 minutes to talk to a branch manager that had no interest really in helping at all. And I think all of us have gone through some of these experiences. I had to go back maybe about five to six times, call a call center, and over a period of five months, finally getting a simple bank account that charged hundreds of dollars a year, that charge 100% interest, and that frankly was, should be a commodity. And I was reflecting on that experience because that's, that might be, that experience was indicative of what most people were going through. And again, this is Sao Paulo, this is not the rural areas. This is supposedly the best experience that these banks were offering. And as I started asking friends and, and people that, 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 I, that I knew had been there for a while, it was, kind of clear that this was the experience that most people were going through. And when I asked why are people putting up with this, the answer was, well, that's the way things are, and that's the way that things uh, will always be. Uh, I had, before moving to Brazil, I had worked also for General Atlantic, and I spent actually a lot of time looking at financial services in Latin America. And uh, I was very curious about the industry because when you think about market size and relevance, Banking is as relevant as it gets, right? The, the five out of the 10 biggest companies in Bovespa are banks, the biggest companies in Mexico are banks, the biggest companies in Colombia are banks. So this is as big as it gets. This is an industry that generates some of the highest returns on equity in the world, Brazilian banking consistently in the bad times and in the good times, generate really, really high uh, uh, rates of return. These are banks that charge some of the highest interest rates in the world, some of the highest fees in the world. But at the same time, they're treating customers like this, and they're leaving in Brazil 60 million people completely out of the system, and in Latin America, 250 million people completely unbanked. So on the one end, very large profitable industry that is really not addressing the needs of most people in the economy. So I. I come from a family of entrepreneurs. I always was thinking for a while how to start a business and what to do, and to me, this seemed like a really interesting question. In Brazil in 2012, I was going through this digitalization where everybody was getting a smartphone. Uh, Brazil was being called the social media capital of the universe, always top five in WhatsApp, in Instagram, in every single social media. And so this opportunity of perhaps building a fully digital bank, looking and acquiring customers fully through smartphones, not needing all those bank branches all over the place, which meant way lower cost that we could pass to the end consumer via lower fees. And then more, more uh, importantly, a, a, a culture that was obsessed about the consumer that would go way and beyond and that ultimately would win because consumers chose us to win. It's, it's sometimes I, I almost find it 
too simple, which is in a, in a market where there are alternatives, whoever offers the best product wins. It's as easy as it goes. And so the strategy of Nubank has been, let's be that company. Let's be the company that works really, really hard to get consumers to love us and to be fanaticals about the products. So that was the idea. Uh, I, I obviously spent a lot of time talking to, to people in the industry. I think the general consensus was, forget it, David. You're Colombian. You have no idea what you're doing in Brazil. These big banks, these are the most powerful economic groups in the country. They will not let you compete. There is a reason why five banks own 85% of all the investments, credit, insurance, very concentrated oligopoly. The regulators won't let you. People won't trust you. All these different arguments, but ultimately the bet was People like to be treated like human beings, and people don't like to wait five months to get a simple bank account. And so I had to do it, and, and that was the bet. And then uh, kind of the rest is a bit history. We had a, a, a big, ambitious goal of a million customers in, in five years, which was absurdly ambitious at the beginning. It was scary to even think about how we were going to do that. And we hit a nerve in the market. Consumers just love the product. We charge no fees, great experience, great culture. And we reached a million customers in two years. We were able to get a banking license. Took four years of going to Brasilia and begging to get a banking license. Uh, the Constitution of Brazil says foreigners cannot own a bank. So we had to go through a presidential exception all the way to get a, a license after four years of doing that. But anyway, a lot of different loopholes. It felt a little bit like playing Mario Bros, where all these like things, all these <laughs> obstacles every morning you wake up and there's a new regulation changing. And 10 years after, we're, we're celebrating our 10-year uh, anniversary this year. We now have 85 million customers in Brazil, Mexico, and Colombia. Uh, we now have almost 50% of the Brazilian adult population is a customers of us. For over 60% of those were the primary bank account. So we've gone from being, we, we're not just a wallet, we own about 25% of the entire Brazil population has us as their primary bank account, which is, has always wow. been our goal. We want to be relevant for these customers. Uh, we've saved over $15 billion in fees that if we hadn't been around, this oligopoly would have extracted and would have maintained in those, in those pockets. We've saved over 250 million hours from customers that had to spend five months going to branches. Imagine what, it, what that means for people to have time back uh, to do what they want instead of waiting in, an, uh, in a banking branch. And we brought a lot of those on bank population as customers. So um, out of the 60 million are banked in Brazil, about 20 million of them are now customers of us, and we're growing a lot in the on bank population. The digitalization of the model serves very well the, 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 that purpose. And now we're effectively banking a big part of, of Latin America. So very proud about the, the impact that we're having as a company, impact about the competition we're bringing to these big banks that are now trying to work really hard to get consumers love. But ultimately, very proud of us having broken a bit of the conventional wisdom, which there were a lot of uh, sacred industries in Latin America that were not to be touched by entrepreneurs because they were owned by big economic groups, by powerful families. And that kind of fear that I heard at the beginning, that is breaking down slowly and now opening up for a lot of a lot of different industries and a lot of new entrepreneurs that are also tackling a bunch of different big problems. Thank you very much, David. It's certainly uh, 10 years of empowering the, the people that had been ignored and breaking a lot of barriers. Adolfo, you were in MIT. You worked for PayPal. And one day, you decided to leave the company, go back to Mexico and start something that had never been done before. I mean, you've been described as a pioneer and have cracked the codes of many firsts. You were the first payments unicorn, the first LATAM investment for many investors, the first uh, payments uh, unicorn, as I said, and you have cracked many other firsts. Can you tell us a little bit about Clip? And how are you transforming the market? Yeah, so, well, thank you. Thank you again for the invitation, Mariana, and all the folks here. Um, so the, the, the story of Clip um, is the story of Silicon Valley uh, in a Mexican company, OK? I, I went to grad school at MIT. After that, I left, uh, after I left MIT. I went to PayPal to start the Latin America operations for, for PayPal. This was 2008, 
so the early days for them in, in, in the region. Uh, of course, we're here in Washington, so um, we can see that we're here in Washington. It's the first time I see you guys dressed like this. We're yeah, yeah, it's like the only tie that I have. Uh, well, two, two, I have two. So, on the, um, uh, I, I was in, in, in the classical uh, uh, visa program that, uh, that the United States has on an H-1B visa, okay, with, uh, with working for PayPal. Uh, I was doing that for a couple of years, opening up Mexico, then stayed in a product management role, and I saw firsthand there how difficult it was for businesses all over the world to accept payments, okay? And in, in, along that process, the, the issue that I saw in, in Mexico in particular, my home country, was especially hard. It was very similar to what David was talking. So it's a process that to get a POS terminal, we provide payments for businesses, for small businesses, that takes about, it took back then between three to nine months to get a simple POS terminal, more than, I actually have a flow chart because I did it for PayPal and then I did it again for, for racing with Clip. It's a flow chart that actually has many non-ending loops. It takes about 52 steps. It costs about, back then it cost about probably 15,000 pesos, which is about $700 a little bit more, depending on the exchange rate. Um, and it's almost impossible. And this left not literally 90% of the businesses in Mexico out of the system. Okay, this was in 2012 when, when I started the company. But I mentioned the background of, of PayPal and the background of my personal story around first H-1B visa, then I got my green card. Then after that, I left for, for, for Mexico, back to Mexico, and the first funding rounds that we received, we didn't receive them from Mexico, we received them from US investors. Clip was the first company to bring Silicon Valley money into Mexico. So the, the story of Clip is, is perfectly linked to the trade and to the links between Mexico and the United States and the region. And I do believe that we as a region can really prosper if we foster more of this type of businesses and companies like Clip, like Nubank, of course, like Kabak. So again, went back to Mexico, started a company, raised the first rounds of, of, of money, and we really started growing uh, in, in 2015, 16, and, and we became, when General Atlantic came as an investor, uh, the, the fifth largest merchant acquirer. I don't want to go into the details, but merchant acquirers are the ones that provide POS services to merchants. Uh, with, with that money, we, we kept growing. Uh, we further uh, raised uh, uh, rounds of investment. And in 2019, 18, sorry, we became Mexico's largest acquirer by a number of merchants. So just Clip by itself has duplicated the, the acceptance or the merchant base that accept digital payments in the country just by ourselves. So it took us roughly eight years. What it took all the banking industry in Mexico put together, 25 years, okay? So roughly six out of 10 merchants that process digital payments in Mexico do it through us, okay? And this was possible in great measure because of first, of course, my, my, my job at PayPal, what I learned there, and then of course the support of many of the investors that we have had, which about probably about 70% of our cap table comes from, from, from the United States. So we really brought uh, financial inclusion to hundreds of thousands of business throughout Mexico, and we did it, uh, actually, David was, it's, it's almost like cheating. Like, it's so simple that it, it sounds like cheating. And it's, number one, just a magnificent product. A product that actually has everything in one place, and that it actually works. Just open the box, sign in, and that's it. You don't have to go to a branch. You don't have to talk to the branch manager. You don't have to go back. You don't have to put a deposit. You don't have, you have everything and it just works. Number one. Number two, an outstanding level of support, customer service. These are people that for the first time are dealing with digital payments in some form. So you actually want a human being answering the phone quickly and saying, sir, what is your problem? And actually solving the problem. The third is the distribution. I think this is, we sometimes underestimate, or we entrepreneurs underestimate how difficult distribution is, and I think this is the case in Latin America. Entire companies have been built in Latin America based on distribution. Uh, so we, we managed to put a, a clip, uh, I remember this when, I, when we were talking to a team, a clip in every corner, okay? A clip in every corner of the country. So you can buy our devices and our, our products in more than 25,000 locations throughout Mexico. You can do it online. 
you can do it also via one of our salespersons. 25,000, how much is that? Just to give you an idea, there are about 12,000 Starbucks in the United States. So it's, it's, wow. it's quite a lot, okay? So you can literally buy a clip in every corner in, in, in the country. And I think the fourth piece is, is, is talent and culture, okay? The, Luis was mentioning this on, on his remarks, that the talent attraction uh, and the talent retention, it's, it's incredibly important for the industries we operate. Traditionally, Latin America, based on uh, the commodity cycle and, and what the big, uh, David was mentioning about oligopolies, that pretty much the business is just there. It's just like, it's just like you know, taking fruit from a tree. It's so easy. You don't need that much talent to do that. It's fairly easy. For the types of businesses that we are in, you require top-notch talent and attracting that talent, make them grow, retain them. It's, it has been the success of, or the, the, the backbone of the success of all of all our companies. That coupled with what we believe at Clip is a very unique culture around how we do things, the type of people that we hire, how we promote people. Uh, that has been, those four factors have been the recipe for, for, for success. And I think we do need more of these stories as a region. Why? Um, Canada, the United States, and Mexico represent the, the largest trading bloc uh, in the world. Uh, we are competing against many regions right now. China, it's, it's the obvious one. And I think we as a region, and Mexico specifically, has a very unique opportunity to jump on that bad wagon. But the help of the, of the United States from the policy perspective is absolutely crucial to make sure that all these companies have the right play field, the right pre uh, playground, and the equal conditions for competition to thrive. Because if not, we're going to end up with the same monopolies, the same commodity cycles that have plagued the region for the last 500 years. <laughs> it's just the same thing. The, the, the changes, the names are the same. It's just the commodity changes, but it's the same thing over the last 500 years. And I think that's, that's what I make sure I want to transmit today. How important is entrepreneurship for the well-being, not of Mexico, not of you know, the people in Guadalajara, for the region as a whole to make it more secure, more competitive, and to make sure that we actually thrive as an economic bloc. Thank you, Adolfo. It is certainly um, all of your stories have changed the life of a lot of customers in Mexico. Carlos, is it true that you came up with the idea of CAVAC after you having a terrible experience while you were selling your car in Colombia and trying to buy another one in Mexico. How did that experience made you come up with the CAVAC business model? Yes. Well, Mariana, first, thanks for having us here and obviously amazing to be alongside you guys. Yeah, my story backs uh, a little bit before, uh, you know, I, I fell into that experience of, of trying to sell my car. I'm, I'm originally from Venezuela. I grew up there and, and was raised there up till I was 25 years old and I left Venezuela, and, and, and I ended up having a, my first formal job outside of Venezuela was in Amazon in 2010. And this was my first exposure to, to digital. It was my first exposure to such an amazing product. And I, and I became obsessed about Amazon and bringing Amazon to Latin America, particularly outside of Brazil and Argentina. There was no solution. There was no e-commerce solution. And I came back to the region obsessed with the idea of, 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 of just building an e-commerce. But I was very naive, I was 27, 28 years old, and, and, and when I went on to build the business, I realized very quickly that if you wanna build a business in Latin America, you have to build like 10 different businesses to make your business work. My story is not a one of simplicity, it's one of complexity. And, and we built, you know, similar to what the B mentioned, you know, we learned that in Latin America, mobile penetration was the way to think about building a business. Nobody had laptops, they went straight from not having internet to having internet in their phones. So we started building this, this, this platform to sell products and to sell e-commerce. And we realized very early in our journey that uh, there weren't any payment solutions for people to buy products online back in 2012 when we started the business. Logistics didn't exist. So DHL, FedEx, these, 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 these logistics providers were not, you know, in Spanish speaking, Latam. So we needed to buy our trucks, create the logistics ourselves, and build the warehouses and do everything ourselves. And it took us, five years to, to, to build the basic uh, infrastructure needed for an e-commerce to, to work. 
And in that process, as an entrepreneur, we made many mistakes. We expanded too quickly. We, 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 we did every, every mistake that you can imagine being a 27-year-old and, and, and being the oldest one in the company. And, and at a certain point in time, I needed to sell my car. I was living in Colombia. And, and I needed to sell my car to move to Mexico. And when I went to sell my car, the way that you, you sell your car in Latin America is very different than the US. In, in the US, 90% of the market to buy and sell cars is formal. It happens in dealerships. Uh, in Latin America, it's the inverse. 90% of the market is informal. You can only sell your cars just going through peers. So I went into this classified site. Uh, I found a stranger that wanted to buy my car. We met in a parking lot. Uh, I was from Venezuela, so I had a little bit of street savviness, so I went with a couple of friends. <laughs> uh, I wasn't completely naive, but I went with a couple of friends, and, and, and uh, I, uh, unfortunately, not those friends. <laughs> friends that just had, you know, moral support. <laughs> and, and, and when I go out, when we do the transaction, everything is working really well. I get paid for the car, and I look at my account, and the money's in my account. And we're, in, and we're in this parking lot, the person's gonna take delivery of the car, and I, when he's about to leave, I check my account again, I was paranoid as hell, and the money was gone. Wow. Don't ask me how, like wow. the collusion with the banks, I don't know what was going on. Uh, we ended up stopping, you know, getting in front of the car. We, we, I didn't lose my car, but it was a terrible, terrible experience. Wow. But I had my flight ticket to leave to Mexico the next day. All my money was, being put into this new company that I was building, uh, Linio. And, and I leave my car in a friend's house, in one of these friends' house, and it was sold like uh, a year later. And I get to Mexico and I start this company, uh, this e-commerce company. All my focus is, is building this, solving that complexity. But a year in, into my journey in Mexico, uh, I needed to buy a car. Uh, when, when, when I needed to buy a car, I faced the same issue that I, I faced when I was trying to sell the car. There was no place where I could go buy this car. I was an immigrant, an entrepreneur, so nobody wanted to give me financing and I couldn't buy a new car. So I ended up buying a 10-year-old car and drove to Guadalajara to pick it up. I find this amazing car. It's a 2000, I don't know, six Jeep Wrangler, a dream car for me. Uh, and, and I go to Guadalajara, buy it, drive back to Mexico, and I'm you know, happy in my car for the first three months, and the police stops me. And they say, Carlos, you're going to prison. I'm like, Why? <laughs> like, well, this car, all the documents are forged. I'm like, no, but that's impossible. I bought it here. No, you're going to prison. I'm like, no, no way. You know, I didn't go to prison, thank God. <laughs> but uh, I lost all the value of that car. Uh, and, and at that point, it was a aha moment for me. It was like either you're the stupidest person in the world or there's a real problem here. And I started to get obsessed about this problem and started to, 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 to try to understand how many people were going through the experience that I went through. And what I learned definitely changed my life. Uh, car markets are huge. Uh, transactions of used cars typically in a, in a country is going to be anywhere between 6 to 8% of the GDP. So it's a big, big market. Uh, but Latin America, the market is very different. Like I mentioned before, 90% of it is informal. And because there's so much informality, what we found out through the investigation and later on in the company, sort of we proved out this number, was that 40% of all transactions end up in fraud. And fraud is not, it's not the fraud that you expect here in the US that you're gonna buy a car and it's a lemon. It's fraud that you can be killed, kidnapped, right. buy a car with forged documents, buy a car that has taxes forged, so you owe a lot of money. And, and, and it's rolling in the system. So, so many people that, you know, and a car is a very important purchase in Latin America. Uh, you're pretty much putting all your savings into, in, into this purchase. Many people, 40% of people go through this process and, and, and end up having, you know, a, a very terrible experience. And not all of them know that experience until the police stops them or, or something like this happens. So that was eye-opening for me, you know, the, that, 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 that problem. And it was very different from the States. And my second question was, okay, if there's so much fraud, uh, what's going on with the financing ecosystem here? And, and what I learned also was revealing only 5% of the market in Latin America of car, or used car transactions gets financed. Uh, in the U.S. is closer to 95%, 90-95%. So nobody really has access to buying a car. And this is something that hit close to home. Uh, I, I grew up in Venezuela. Uh, my dad was in the military. We didn't have a lot of money, so I had to buy my first car when I had my when I had worked for quite a, quite a bit. I bought it at 22, 
and, and I used public transportation uh, up until then. And public transportation in Latin America is two hours in, two hours out. Okay. It's terrible, it's unsafe. And the moment I bought my car, uh, I, remember, I remember that because it, it was the biggest change that I've had, stepping change that I have in my life, and I built Kavak and, and all these things. Uh, two things changed for me. One, uh, my business started to grow better because I could be in more places, be more efficient. Two, my social life improved significantly as well. And, and, I, and I remember that car as the thing that really changed my life. I had to pay like 80% of my salary uh, to, to, to make payments on that car the first year. But after the year two, it was like 5% of my, of my salary. And, and I would say that 90% of it was because I had that car. So when I saw that only 5% of people in Latin America were getting financed, uh, I knew that there was a real opportunity. When you translate this into, into, into people, out of 10 people in the US, seven have cars. In Latin America, out of 10 people, 1.5 have cars. So my obsession became very simple. I want to get that 1.5 to 7. I want to give people the opportunity to buy that first car. And I want to make sure that I do it without these people experiencing fraud. And ideally, without experiencing the lemon aspect of buying a car, which is now, after seven years, I can say it's impossible. As th there's two things that are sure in life, death and your car breaking down. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and well, if you're in Uruguay, it's, it's, it's <laughs> so, so I start this business, when I start this business, uh, I call Luis and Martino because they have, they have, they, 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 they were, they saw my first business and they came to me, Carlos, and they said, no, we're not going to invest in the e-commerce business because of this, this, this. I took the feedback. And, and I call them up and I say, well, I have this new idea. Uh, and the, the, the solution that I was presenting was impossible. Uh, I was telling to the world in the moment, I don't know if you remember that slide of Uber without cars, Airbnb without hotels. Everything was asset light at the moment. That was trending. And I'm telling to everybody, you know what? We're not going to go asset light, guys. Uh, because from my experience building Lino, you have to build the, the infrastructure before you build the business. So we in order to build Kawak and to, and to provide a solution of fraud and financial inclusion, we have to build a lot of infrastructure. And the first thing that we need to do is we need to build a business to buy cars from peer, from regular people. And we're going to buy every single type of car and we're going to put the capital down to provide that liquidity for customers. Second, all of those cars we're going to recondition and we're going to provide warranty to those cars. The car market could be any, anywhere between four to seven times bigger than the new car market. So if we're going to be successful, we're going to have factories four or seven times bigger than all the OEMs combined. So we're going to get into that level of complexity of auto parts, production, uh, delivery. Uh, the third, we're going to build this uh, e-commerce solution uh, with, with a mobile solution to be able to provide the best customer experience for users to one click, buy their car, get access to financing warranties and all of these things with the complexity that cars will come back to you. Clips don't come back to you. My, everything that I sell comes back to haunt me uh, when it breaks down, right? But we're going we're gonna to be there when it happens for our customers to, to be able to provide a solution. And fourth, we need to build a, a fintech solution to finance these users because banks are not going to take the risk that we need to take to you know, put people into their first car. So it was basically trying to explain to, to, my, to my partners today that we were building a business that was as complex as, that had the data and personalization complexity of a Spotify, uh, the, experience, the, the, the complexity of a customer experience like an Amazon, the complexity of, a, of, a, of any you know, financial institution to build this, and the complexity of Toyota from an operational standpoint. If all of these companies got together and had a party, a dysfunctional kid like Kawak was gonna be born. <laughs> of course, uh, Luis and Martin saw me and said, Carlos, yeah, it seems good, but no. <laughs> And this was 2016, and we, there, there was no capital in Latin America. There was no capital before when we started Lino, in Mexico uh, even less. And uh, we did the biggest seed round in the history of, of, of Mexico up until that point. It was a $3 million seed round. And I had to find two. Institutional investment only put one. And we didn't have, with, with $3 million, you cannot build this ambition that, you know, that I had laid out. So we focused on building technology. We, we focused on, 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 on the things that you know, can help us build a profitable company fairly quickly before we, we really scaled it. And uh, it was the first three years, it was very complex, very hard to just get off the ground. 
but afterwards we saw that uh, uh, it was, I think the, uh, hot, the second hot moment for us was when somebody bought like the first car at 3 a.m. from their phone. We said, you know, we, we really have something here. And, and after six years since we went live, uh, Kawak right now operates in 10 countries. Uh, uh, we operate in, in all Latin America, Brazil, uh, Mexico, Chile, Colombia, Peru, and Argentina. But we also operate out of Turkey and the Middle East. Uh, our way of thinking is that if you can get killed in a transaction and you don't have financing solution, I'm your guy. <laughs> uh, and those are the type of countries that we like. Uh, <laughs> so it's not simple. <laughs> and and uh, we, we've, been, we've been blessed by, by, by having an opportunity to provide uh, to 40% of our customers their car for the first time in their life. And, and that's what moves us today. And what we see is still the, the, the cohorts are, are young, but what we're seeing is that after a couple of years, people that are buying their car for the first time increase their salary up to 50% throughout the first couple of years. So that, 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 that thing that happened to me is something that relates to everybody else. 20% of people change their job or move uh, because they have this car. And more importantly, uh, our customers, when they buy their first car, their family, the only thing that they cannot get back home is without that car. If you get to your house and you live with six people and you, you come with a car, you cannot go back to that home without, the, without your car. So we've been able to have the lowest default rates of our industry when it comes to financing cars, not only because we're providing this financing, but because we provide a solution when the car breaks down. We're there with a the customer every single step of the way so because we're vertically integrated. So we've been, we've been, we've been blessed with, with, with great product market fit, with the ability to help in our customers, but uh, we've had to take uh, care of, you know, we're a mix of a police enforcement agency to, to work with, to, to, to take care of fraud, and we, we, have, we have to work with all of this infrastructure to make that happen. So it's very complex on the, on the back end, but for the customer, it's, it's a simple experience, or as simple as it, as it can get to buy and sell a car. Thank you so much, Carlos. Um, since you all started, the financial and economic conditions have radically changed. We are in a completely different world now, right? I mean, the cost of money is no longer zero. There is inflation. There's a lot of economies that are experiencing headwinds. Carlos, you mentioned uh, and your last round of private investment made CAVAC at the time the most valuable startup in Latin America. You have actually brought investors to Mexico and into the ecosystem that had never invested in the region before. How are companies like yours adapting to this higher interest rates and tighter capital environment? Good question. Well, first, most valuable startup is David. I think we, 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 I will get to we, that. We, 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 we take the most private valuable startup at a time. Yeah. But David, you know, we're standing on David's shoulders here. Uh, uh, well, it's been, it's been complex. You know, we're, we're a very asset uh, intense and capital intense business. So like when interest rate changes, it makes the products more, more, more expensive for our customers. Uh, and and we, we, for us, it was not only the interest, rate, interest rates changing, it was also inflation happening and, and going, you know, products are 30% more expensive than they were a couple of years ago. So you have to deal with that change in your customer perception of your product, the, the affordability of your product, and the internal process that you have to change. For us, I think, you know, the biggest, when, when, when markets shift so fast, uh, the biggest thing that you have to uh, is make sure that you stop and you realize that market has shifted, your cost of capital has changed, and you have to become a little bit more tight right. and, and, and more disciplined. Uh, the lucky thing about being a Latin American entrepreneur is that's, that's our home game. You know, we've always been plagued with inflation, with high interest rates, with problems. So for me, it was just like a summer fling of, you know, whoa, we now have all of this capital. There's no interest. Like it was, it was a good year and a half of sort of bonanza. Right. But uh, when things change, it was just a reminder that, you know, we're back home. Uh, it's <laughs> Sounds familiar. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and treating it as a, as a home game, not getting freaked out, understanding that, it's, that what's happening is, is gonna, in the long term is going to be good. I think what's happening with the, with the rates in the U.S., I think in the long term is going to be good for the U.S., and if it's good for the U.S., it's going to be good for the broader region. I think as an entrepreneur, it landed me, like, as soon as I was, like, uh, 
lifting up and you know things started to become simple again it landed me back to the ground and, and got me you know got me to be more disciplined so we're we, we just became more disciplined with with how we operate with with how we were thinking about our business model and and and, and adapt it and and and, and it's it, though like I think you have to when you're building a business you have to think you cannot build a business on the hype nor on the low uh, because in the end, we're going to be here for the next 40 years. You have to build a business and thinking about, you know, how things look in the middle. And, and for us, it's been about sort of just making sure that we, we, we understand that this increase in difficulty to, you know, to get capital, et cetera, is going to be good for us in the long run if we're here on the other side. And, and, and it's been about just embracing the good of, of this in the same way that we did it back before. As entrepreneurs, you have to be optimistic regardless of the macro. The macro doesn't mind, doesn't, you, you cannot control the macro, you can only control the micro, so you just have to focus on what you, what, what, what you can move and, and make sure that you, you're adapted to what's going on you know, in, the, in your surroundings. It was, it was interesting to see yeah. as interest rate went up in the US in 2021, how everybody was talking about that and everybody continues to talk about that, right? You're asking that question and as if high inflation is this alien uh, effect Correct. for us is the only thing we've seen for, for decades, right? High inflation interest rate, what's, why is that even a, a point of conversation? Correct. Uh, it's very familiar. But David, now that you are uh, talking, you have been one of the successful entrepreneurs that have had a debut on Wall Street. Tell us about that important milestone. I mean, you raised more than $2 billion in your IPO. How is that journey as a public company has been for you? Yeah, so we, we started in, a, in 2013 in an environment of a lot of scarcity of capital. It was very hard to find the capital. We also were the first in investment of a lot of U.S. funds because it was impossible to, to raise capital locally. Um, and we had to see a lot of really, as Carlos was saying, a lot of macro changes. We saw the worst recession in Brazil in 100 years. We saw presidential impeachment, corruption scandals. It is the nightmare scenario of any entrepreneur. That's, what, that's, that's sort of what we saw. All right. And so by the end of, by 2019, 2020, things started to feel just too good. There was just too much capital. And we are in financial services. We have, we're, we're, we have banking licenses. We are giving credit. We're in a capital intensive business. So right. that meant we will need to raise, we were going to have to raise a lot of capital and access to capital. And ultimately, the best access to capital is the public markets. So the environment felt so frothy. And we, it was so clear to us that we're going to need capital that we decided that it was time to figure out how to go public. And I think partly was a bit of that foresight, partly was a lot of luck. Our IPO timing was as good as it gets. We went public in December in New York in 21, and then two weeks after it was 22, and then the entire environment changed. Yeah. So we're very lucky into entering in this new crisis, that we've seen many of those, very, very well capitalized. Um, it was painful to see, to be a public company in that environment where the stock price went down a lot because right. interest rate changed a, a lot. A lot of volatility, yeah. But we had been there before, and so it was an opportunity for us to really focus the business on continue operating through this environment. The good news is we had over $3 billion of capital, and the business was increasingly profitable uh, to the point where every single quarter or thing or projections or consensus has now already increased about 200%. The market was not really expecting as such a significant shift into profitability. So there was some pain in, in that rearrangement, but in, in hindsight, it was a really good, was great timing, was probably the best thing we could have done for the business at that point. And, uh, and positioned us very well to continue growing in an environment where a lot of people were breaking and we were accelerating. Uh, capital is certainly critical, but what about people, Adolfo? Are there enough skilled workers in the region? How do you do it to attract and retain talent? Yeah, so this is, this is I think, something we, we all have struggled. And I think the peak of the struggle was 2021, like David was mentioning, with all this money coming in, just the inflation that we saw in, in salaries and everything was just, was just outrageous. But what, the, the way we have done it at Clip, and, and I have been very public about this, that I have a PhD in mistakes and uh, in Clip, and that PhD is with a specialization in, in people. Okay, that, that's where I've been specialized in, in, in the mistakes that I've made. But okay. we, or I learned the, 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 the lessons, I think the, 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 hard way, the hard way from the early days. And we, we have tried to build a company 
where people can really thrive on a professional, uh, on a professional basis. Uh, we have done it via several steps from the attraction of talent. So we attract talent based on a profile that, that, that we have based on the culture and the values of a company. We interview based, of course, on those qualifications and the qualifications uh, around the values and the profile, what we call the Clipper profile. Then once uh, those people are inside or, or the Clippers come, come inside, the evaluation and the performance is just like any other company. It's linked to the performance of the, of the employee, of a person. But there's a component about the culture. So people are under bonuses type also around how are they closely aligned with the cultures and the value that we have as, as a company. And also, we need to train because we're, we're still in a very, very early market for talent in Latin America in, in technology. So we provide local inside training to Clippers. So we try to grow them from the inside, really try to grow the employees that come to the company and grow them via training, via specialization. And we encourage them to switch jobs inside the company so they learn uh, multiple things that on, 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 the, on the area of the, of, of the company they, they are. So that being said, Latin America, I think the case of, for example, Brazil and, 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 and Argentina, they had a huge uh, dot-com moment, what Martin was mentioning yeah. in submarino.com. Um, and that pool of talent that was developed during those years, right now it's, it's the pool of talent that is the, 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 the management of many of the tech companies throughout the region. In the case of Mexico, Mexico back then had, uh, welcome to Mexico, the highest um, uh, network or internet costs in the world. So Mexico did not have an internet moment right. uh, back in 2000 in the dot-com boom. So we did not develop that critical middle management uh, base. base of people that other countries like Brazil and Argentina did actually have. So what we have done at Clip is we have several offices. We have offices, of course, in, in Mexico. We have offices in the United States. We have a very large office also in Argentina. So we have, based on this model that I just mentioned on attraction, retention, and promotion, is that we have uh, attracted the, 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 the people from many parts of the world. We have people from all over the world. And I think the, the basis of the success has been this model. And there's one question we, we do Customer service, sorry, not customer service. We do employee service every 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 quarter, and we always rank very high in, in internal net promoter scores. We rank in most metrics or in all metrics above 80, and in most above above 90. But the one that we also we get a perfect score uh, every single time is when we ask Clippers, um, "What is it that you like most about uh, Clip?" And the answer is, "I like that when I come to Clip, I can be myself." Okay, and that is, that is a very rare thing in, in, in a company in, in, in Mexico. Uh, and we're extremely proud that of the culture that we have created, the, the diversity that we have. 40% of our workforce, for example, it's, it's women, 60% is men. We're not 50-50 there, but we're in Mexico in financial services, in technology, so it's <laughs> kind of an uphill battle. Uh, but the, 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 the key the absolute key for any, any, any company, any startup, is the talent that they're, they're, they're able to attract. And I think um, the, 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 the work that we have done in Clip, especially the last five years, it's, it's, it has been quite remarkable in this sense. We've spoken about the challenge of capital. We've mm -hmm. spoken about people. How about the incumbency, David? I assume that mm -hmm. when you were this cool kid from Colombia arriving in Brazil where you have these big five traditional incumbent banks. Maybe at the beginning they didn't feel very threatened by you. But now that you've become so successful, you have your bike banking license, are they trying to crush you? <laughs> uh, absolutely. Uh, no, it's, it's been interesting. There was, there's a phrase that we have in our, in our headquarters that, that apparently attributed to Gandhi which says, um, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. 
<laughs> and that has that has that exemplifies very well how, how the difference we've gone through different stages. First, we were completely ignored. Then we're too big to even think about these little, you know, little thing trying to sell credit cards, right? Okay. At some point, they woke up, but then it was all about ridiculizing. You guys are never gonna make any money. You gonna lose all your. You don't know how to do credit. You, you, you crazy. That doesn't make any sense. Um, and, f and for a very long time, was in that in that phase. We're in the fight mode now, absolutely. But to the credit of the industry, in the in the early days when I was had the idea, I, I, as I said earlier, people saying oh, they're gonna they're gonna crush you, they're gonna kill you, they're right. gonna kidnap your kids. It has been a very, very fair competition they, uh, with the incumbents. They are competing, they're rough competitors, they're competing really hard. Some are harder than others, some are more agile than others. Uh, but it's very fair, it's, it's, very, very, it's very healthy competition. Everybody's competing, as I said earlier, to provide the best products and services, to decrease uh, prices, to get wow. the consumers to love us. And so, from that sense, I think that's that's really great to see in Latin America. It has not been a dirty competition. Uh, sometimes they do get the regulators involved, and you have to ISO. you have to move one, one place to another. But but in general, it has been very fair, and so we, we're just extremely happy competitors. Makes everybody better, and makes consumers ultimately happier. Ha well, surprisingly happy news, Adolfo. How about governments? Are there? inhibitors or supporters to your to this development of this ecosystem yeah so i think it's it's a mixed bag right um the, the there was a very important reform in mexico in 2013 that it enabled the creation of companies like clip what we call aggregators or psp payment service providers for those of you that don't know the technical term paypal is a psp okay uh and that reform really you know started a movement of, of new companies to start providing payment services to 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 especially to, to merchants, also to consumers, but especially to merchants. Uh, and along the way, uh, companies have been created. Uh, unfortunately, Mexico, it's relatively easy to start a business. Uh, the problem is scaling the business because that's when incumbents come in, and that's where this is why I say a mixed bag. So the government is extremely supportive of what we do because we're bringing financial inclusion, we're bringing uh, uh, payment services to merchants, everybody gets into the system. I mean, it's, it's, it's good for everyone, right? Uh, however, incumbents uh, are really fighting uh, via mostly regulation to inhibit the growth. And, and the proof of this is when I started CLIP, uh, well, sorry, when, when this law was passed, two or three years later, we had about 100 companies doing what we do, okay? Today, we basically have two. Wow. So everybody was. So they've every, succeeded. Everybody is dead. Most, most of them are dead. So, yes, they have succeeded in this. And this, they have done via not changing regulation, but preserving the status quo, which is pretty, pretty hard. The Mexican payment system is the most in, uh, vertically integrated financial uh, payment system in the world. Yeah. And it's at least, at least 15 years behind Brazil. Wow. Yeah, I'm not saying 15 years behind Sweden or some idyllic, you know. Yeah, yeah. 15 years behind Brazil, which is very, it's a, it's a country that is very similar to Mexico. And it has to do with this vertical integration that has enabled uh, Mexican banks to extract a huge amount of consumer surplus and reporting extra normal profits on, 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 on their operations. So contrary to David in, in Brazil, the competition uh, has not been fair. And I think that's one of the things that we as, 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 as startups, and regulators need to be wary about is that we need these companies to really flourish. Right. We need this type of companies to really flourish. And, and one of the issues that we have in Mexico, in the general economy in Mexico, is that we have bottlenecks all over the economy because of this oligopolies and these very, very highly concentrated industries. The payment system is particularly painful because if you don't have a fully developed financial uh, payment system, you cannot have fully enabled digitalization of the economy. You will never have it. It doesn't matter how many YouTube videos people watch. If people cannot transact, if people cannot do commerce in a much more efficient way, it doesn't really add up to you know the, the, the GDP and, and, and the progress of the economy. So mm -hmm. I think that's, so we have a mix back there. There's the, there are the best intentions, 
but we need more forceful and, 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 and uh, more, more forceful regulation that actually starts leveling the, 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 the play field because right now the, 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 the play field is completely un, uneven. Okay? Mm. So, um, mix back. <laughs> Carlos, okay, talking about this multiplier effect. Uh, in the United States, there is a term called uh, the PayPal mafia, right? Sort of, it's a term that we use to describe this incredible team of successful people that left PayPal to create their own companies. In Latin America, there is a term called the Lino mafia, and you were the CEO and the most successful case. How can we ensure that that multiplier effect in Latin America is as successful as, as the one in the US? I think by having more David Vélez, right? Uh, uh, as people, you know, when we, when we started Lino, there was no success cases in, in, in Mexico, very few in Brazil, uh, and it was just difficult to get great talent to work with you. You know, we, uh, my CMO was 22, so no experience at all. And it was difficult to convince people to come, you know, from, from, from a place of experience to, to come and build. And I think from the cushy job. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was difficult. It continues to be. But, you know, I think what, 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 what changed was when, 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 when people started to see success stories, more people, you know, started to leave their jobs and started to put, you know, their, their, their time into something a little bit more purposeful around building something for themselves or, 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 or in a company. And I think that that's what gets the multiplier effect going. It's just, you know, that you see friends going, you know, try to, to do something, trying to build, then becoming successful, and then you're replicating that behavior. And we saw that at Lino, you know. We, we were all very young when we started. We went through hardship, and I think like 70 companies have been founded uh, out of people that work with us there. Uh, and that, you know, later happened with Rappi. Like, it, 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 Rappi, I think, would be the biggest uh, success case in terms of mafias being created in Latin America today. And it's just, because, it's just giving the exposure to people to dream, you know. Like, if you see my, my, my team in Kawak, most of them, their first job was, was, was with me. And most of them, you know, heard that everything was impossible. And most of them saw that it wasn't. Right. Uh, so, like, the ability of them to dream is very different than the ability of, of that normal people have to dream because, they, they see, they've gone through this sort of uh, places of impossibility and created something. So they don't think about when they're gonna build something, whether it's gonna be impossible or not. They think, they think all is possible. Optimism is at the core of what you do. And I think the multiplier effects is just a relationship of optimism. The, the thing that I like to uh, tell my team a lot when we work is that you have two ways of looking at life, from a pessimistic angle or from an optimistic angle. If you look at it from a pessimistic angle, you're gonna see all the problems. Right. Anybody can see problems, by the way, that's easy. But when you look at it from the, an optimistic angle, you're going to see all the solutions. So what you need to do is make sure that you're always uh, uh, lining up 20 solutions to a certain issue that you're facing before you think about the problems. Because once you think about the problems, you know, you're going to put it into context. And I think entrepreneurship and building companies is just about that concept. And once people experience it over and over, you create this multiplier effect. Uh, but you need the role models. You need you need, you need a reason to believe that you know, what you're going to do can become successful in the long run for your family, for your employees, for your stakeholders. So I think it's about seeing exits. Brazil has several exits. Mexico, we, st we, we have some exits, but we still haven't seen you know, this big IPO exits. And, and, and that's our job right now, is making sure that we, 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 we get to a position where we can show the Mexican entrepreneurs that it is possible to you know, build companies like Nubank uh, that, that create, that create mm -hmm. value and you get more talent coming into the ecosystem. I think it's all about that. Yeah. Like Dr. Henry was saying yesterday, right? Sort of, you guys uh, are the optimists and think tank people are usually the pessimists. So <laughs> with that, uh, we have a, a room full of, uh, full of people and I am sure they will have uh, a lot of questions. So if you do, please raise your hand uh, and the mic will be, uh, will come to you, or I don't know if we've received any questions through the QR code. Uh, please, <clears throat> just if I ask you yes. to state your name and be short. We have our first question through the QR code from Allison with Bloomberg, who asks that uh, a lot of Latin American countries have kicked off monetary easing. 
Is that going to open the door for reviving equity fundraising? And how long will this recovery take for equity funding to come back? I, I didn't hear. The, can you, uh, can you repeat it? Can you repeat yeah. that? Because I, I, I couldn't hear it. Maybe I'm just. Can, no, no, me neither. Me is it loud enough here? A lot of countries in Latin America have kicked off monetary easing. Is that going to open the door for equity fund, uh, for, to, for reviving equity fundraising? And how long will this recovery take for equity funding to come back? Equity funding. Okay, I can talk about that. Yeah, ab absolutely. I think, and you're already starting to see the, uh, the capital starting to flow back to the region. Uh, I think the I think kind of the last kind of bubble showed that there were exits, that there are big markets, there are big opportunities here, and definitely as as people start feeling much more comfortable, and some of these Latin American markets here in Brazil was way ahead of the U.S. in, in the in the in the eastern side, uh, is coming with additional equity and investment into the region. So I think it's it's just it's probably inevitable that that's going to happen. You want to do the other one? Absolutely. Bertha with the Embassy of Brazil asks that the Brazilian government has been working hard to boost a more digital economy, including expanding connectivity and payments. What other initiatives could support digital entrepreneurs in Brazil specifically? Yeah, so I, 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 would, I should say Brazil is an unbelievable success story in terms of digitalization and payments. Uh, you're comparing... Pips, right? Yeah, with PICS, with the QR code payment infrastructure, comparing it with Sweden. I would say Brazil is five years ahead of the U.S. Uh, it has completely leapfrogged the U.S., has completely leapfrogged most European countries to the point where uh, this new inf uh, payment infrastructure where you can pay free uh, to other people, to businesses, is growing at a speed that, um, that really hasn't seen anywhere in the world, maybe similar to India with UPI. Um, at the same time, also, kind of the general, you, you've had a regulator that has thought a lot about competition. I think that's partly what's driving the difference between Mexico and Brazil in, the ans in our answers around regulation. Yeah. The regulator in Brazil has been very independent, has been very consistent. While there's been a lot of changes in governments from left to right to left to right, you have an independent central bank that has been consistent through the last decade and has had a very long-term orientation in terms of how, how to build infrastructure and, and regulation. And, and I think a lot, of this, a lot of the kind of examples are there, a lot of the success cases are there. So this is just bringing many more entrepreneurs in all the industries. If we were able to do it in banking, which again seemed almost uh, sacred, now you have people in, uh, Martin talked about ARCO in education, you have people in healthcare, you have people in transportation. Uh, AI is, is a new technology that is really being discussed everywhere in the country. So it's a, it's a very bright, uh, very bright picture, I think, generally what you see in Brazil. Let me just ask, jump in. Uh, the Mexican Central Bank mm -hmm. recently launched something called CODI, right? Mm -hmm. Which is trying to, to, to imitate PICS. Are you guys optimistic about that for Mexico? Yeah, so the, just, I, I don't want to go deep into the weeds, because it's, but I think you have basically two success stories. Brazil and India, okay? In the case of India, it's a system called UPI, right. which is a piece of technology that is amazing, but is based or rides on top of another system called Adahar, which is the digital identity system of India. So it makes transactions very easy. So on top of that, they mounted an amazing technology for payments, okay? So, but you first needed that, that ID system. In the case of Brazil, uh, the central bank released a thing called PIX, which, like correctly David mentioned, it has grown even faster than UPI. But Brazil was a country that was already incredibly penetrated from a financial point of view, both on the consumer side and on the merchant side. In the case of, and it is a well-designed uh, uh, product, and it has the right incentives. In the case of Mexico, we don't have the unique ID system of India, uh, and we don't have the penetration that we had in Brazil. And the product, this quality product, is not well-designed. So it hasn't taken off, it hasn't taken off. Uh, and because you need certain things to happen first, you need either to have something like you have in India, a, a unique ID system, and then you mount on top of that the, the, the financial uh, or the payment system, or you need to have more penetration 
within the population of financial services, both on the consumer and the business side, and then you mount something on top of that, and the product has to be correctly designed from a product user interface perspective and from an incentive perspective. So that's the issue, and, and it, it didn't work, and I don't think it's gonna work. We need something different. Um, we, I, my, in my view, is that we should follow more of the route of Brazil, which is via competition, accelerate via even competition, not unfair competition, yeah. accelerate the penetration of financial service in the population, and based on that, you can, you can develop something similar to, to PICS, and then it will take off. And it's a massive wave, a massive tie for everyone, because, I mean, you have seen it in, 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 in Nubank. When that happens, it doesn't really take share away from, from the, 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 the money that is already digital. It takes cash away from the economy. And when you take cash away from the economy, just if you take four, five, six, seven points of cash out of the economy and, and make and it to digital. To the formal economy. To, yeah, to the formal economy, you can create several billion dollar companies because the markets are so big. So that's the beauty of those systems, but you need to lay the groundwork first for that to happen. To make it that level. The last question, please. Uh, New Bank's card in Mexico being the highest NPS score uh, product in the world, or one of the highest. Can you talk a little bit about the path to get there? Because it's a very ambitious goal for any startup. Yeah, sure. So uh, I remember in the early days discussing with my co-founders that we were about to launch a product in a completely red ocean, that it was completely commoditized there was very little differentiation and that there was a big challenge about figuring out how to compete in a market that's so penetrated and where all products are, com are undifferentiated. And, and also a product that people generally felt really ne negative emotions about, a credit card, right? You're charging very high interest rates. It's not a product that any, nobody wakes up in the morning saying, I'm gonna, this is the day I'm getting my new credit card. It, it, you do that for an iPhone, you don't do that, well, <laughs> you, you do that for a car, you don't do that for a credit card. So, Part of the challenge was figuring out how to do, how to create that experience, and, and our bet was um, it really be, be, begins around company culture, where our number one value has always been about we, we want a design for customers, we want customers to be global fanatically. Once you have that as a value, then you walk backwards into creating a product and a business that reinforces that value. And with that, we just went and executed a product where every single detail mattered. Uh, I answer customer calls for a very long time in my phone. There is a, this great email that we have in our, in our headquarters from my co-founder responding to a customer in the early days saying, we had really apologize for being late in answering your email. She was answering 30 minutes late after the email came in. I just had my first baby. Oh. <laughs> so that's the level of, of, wow. of obsession we had about this has to be a product that is unbelievably good. Uh, because in a market that was so commoditized, that's how we wanted to differentiate ourselves. And so out of those stories and those values, then you had an entire company culture built around uh, 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 that business, and that's how we wanted to show ourselves and how, how we wanted to operate. And so we launched our products in Brazil, and we, given that experience and the pain, we got to that 88, 87 NPS in Brazil, which I always tell the story, for a very long time, I went around very proud saying this is the highest NPS in the world, in an investor meeting, somebody said, no, Tesla has a 90. And I was really upset with that metric. It was like, how come? Why well, is Tesla? And then we launched Mexico. And to all of our surprises, because we heard a lot of things like, it's going to be really hard to replicate Brazil in Mexico, very different countries. Uh, you know, it is a very specific growing virally. It's very specific to Brazil. We just sent a lot of people from Brazil to Mexico. We made sure that we created the same culture in our Mexico office. We made sure that that some of the philosophy around product got extended, and we got a 94 NPS in Mexico, which is higher than Tesla, and today we think it's the highest NPS of any consumer product in the world, again, higher than an iPhone or a Tesla, for a credit card. And so I think ultimately is this is the product market uh, fit. It is a market that is in a lot of consumer pain. The pain in Mexico is bigger than in Brazil because penetration of credit card in Mexico is 12%. In Brazil, it was 35 so you have 88% of the 
consumers out of the system. That means bigger pain. That means not being welcome into a branch, so higher pain. Meets a product that already had a learning curve and we knew how to do it better than we did it in Brazil. And so that combination takes us to this higher NPS. Huge challenge to maintain it at that level as you scale. You can do it when you have 20 customers. When you have 85 million, you have so many different segments in that population that is a big challenge around how do you really design for every single subsegment. But uh, otherwise, I think that's just kind of the opportunity of finding these underserved markets that have so much pain. Well, thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Carlos, Adolfo, David. And uh, this event will go um, public tomorrow. And also, CSIS will soon be uh, publishing a white paper on this topic. So please help us keep this conversation alive. I think there's a lot of things that, uh, uh, you know, sort of, we need to tell this story and say it here in Washington, hopefully with uh, the hope that policymakers in Washington will put pressure in the, in, in the governments in Latin America to allow this ecosystem to continue to flourish. Thank you very much. Ryan Berg, thank you very much, and CSIS for having us all today. Thank you. Thank you.